All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm not sure where everybody is today, but uh, I'm sure they'll come when they have time. Anyway, um, we're going to get started today, and we're going to talk a little bit more about graphic design. And this time we'll get into the you know, fundamentals of how we lay things out, what are margins, what are flow lines, what are grid intervals, et cetera. And we'll talk about kind of the mechanics, and then we'll get into some actual InDesign practice. Um, I'm having some trouble thus far today logging into the remote desktop. I've already sent an email to the IT department to ask what's what's going on. So maybe you've experienced that, maybe not. Uh, worst case is I will show you it on my Mac, and you can still we can still get through it, um, and hopefully it'll be back up soon. That being said, I also want to point out that your assignment 103 has been posted. Um, so this is due on October 10th, which is still a little bit away. Um, it is uh, an 11 by 17. So we're changing size format here. It's an 11 by 17 poster that is either for a DVC architecture or industrial design lecture series. So I know I have students that are both in architecture and in industrial design. Whatever um, you're in, whatever major you're in, do a lecture series for that. If you're in the landscape, do a lecture series for landscape. Or if you want to do it, if you're in industrial design and you want to do it for architecture, that's fine too. Um, but I'm not mandating that it all has to be architecture related. So if you want to change it and have it uh, be a slightly different subject matter, that's okay with me. Uh, the key here is that we're going to be doing a lecture series. This is based on uh, the content that they do every year. So there's a lecture series every spring. And they have and, and invite visiting architects to come and uh, you know, present their lectures. It's typically done via Zoom. Um, although back in the day when we were in person, they would be done in person, but lately it's been done by Zoom. So you're going to invent a lecture series. If you want to use a, um, you know, last year's lecture series and just copy that, that's fine in terms of who's coming to speak. If you want to invent your own lecture series, that's also fine. If you want to invite dead architects to come and speak and have something like that, that works. Um, so if any of those options are, are just fine with me. Um, so we're going to be creating this poster. You're going to have a combination of text and images in all likely, likelihood. Um, you want to pay careful attention to your color choices, your photographic quality, what images you're using, your hierarchy of your text, what typography choices you're making um, to kind of assemble all of this into a final design poster. Like I said, it's due on Monday the 10th. So you have a little bit of time to work on it, a week and a half or so. Um, and you're also going to have three peer reviews for this assignment, just like you had for the previous two. I'm not sure whether you got your previous peer assignments for your assignment 102 that you turned in last Monday, but um, if you didn't, I'll go in and make sure that those were assigned. Last semester, they assigned automatically. This semester, it appears that I have to click a button. So I'll make sure I click that button. I haven't done it yet. So for today, um, since we're here and looking at it, I'm going to go ahead and pull up our uh, exercise 111 just so we can kind of see that. And essentially what exercise 111 is, is it's a small version. So we're doing a four by six sheet of paper, and you're going to do a layout on that four by six sheet of paper that has something to do with the architecture department, maybe something to do with the industrial design department. It's kind of an informational flyer. Etc. Really, this is about exploring the design ideas and figuring out how to assemble multiple images together and, and get it all on one page. Um, so you've got some flexibility in, in what it is we're actually creating today. That'll obviously be turned into Canvas as a JPEG by midnight. Okay. So with that being said, we're going to flip over and um, switch to, where'd my lecture go? Switch into lecture mode. Perfect. And so this is graphic design two structure and organization. So we're going to talk today about the general structure and organization strategies. Hold on. I want to make sure that I get my uh, remote up here so that I can draw on the slides. <laughs> All right. So we'll talk first about grid systems. And this is a great underlying strategy for how we start to establish our uh, layouts. So when I talk about the anatomy of grids, I'm going to go through a bunch of different topics. Some of these are perfectly obvious. So you've all heard of margins before. You know what margins are, and their fundamental purpose is to direct you, the viewer of the page, into the content. 
rather than to be looking off in the in the sides. It's about focusing your attention on the the main visual elements, whether that's text or images, uh, and they're going to vary depending on the size of the format or the overall design. They do sometimes contain sub elements, so you might have a footnote that shows up in the margin or a page number. Those are all extra information, so it's not content. It's just extra information that you're going to use. So these margins are really fundamentally about trying to get the focus of your attention on the page itself. So they're the border that goes around the page. And I'll keep coming back to this slide. You'll see this slide a number of times. But um, this area in blue that I just highlighted would be the margin of this particular page. Columns, also something you're probably familiar with, though no, not too many people read the actual physical newspaper anymore, but columns, uh, maybe in magazines, they're basically vertical divisions of space that are used to align elements. You may have multiple columns on a page, like the one that you see here to the right, or you may have just a single column of text. Maybe your English or history paper is just a single column of text. The width of a column can vary depending on the function of the design, the desired line length, what feels appropriate, et cetera. So if we're looking at that same image, these areas that are highlighting in blue are the columns on this particular page. So this would have four columns. Column intervals or gutter widths are the inactive negative spaces that are in between the columns. So we need to have those so that the text doesn't collide with the next column. So it's absolutely critical. So while we may have multiple columns, we always have to have a little bit of space between them as highlighted in these blue areas, because otherwise, if you imagine text, you wouldn't know where one line of text ended and the next line of text started. So we need that little bit of space in between. So those column intervals become a really important piece of the design process. Flow lines. So I like to think of the two major things that we need to think about when we're working in the grid design system is what is our column? Thereby, what are our column intervals? What are our gaps between the columns? And where on the page is what's called a flow line? And the flow line is the cross to the vertical column. It's what divides the page into a horizontal line. It gives you an alignment point. I think this image to our right here is a perfect example where we have columns of text there, and then we have this flow line that runs right across there, across the whole page. That's the flow line in this example. Now, the flow line doesn't always have to fall a third of the way up or a quarter of the way up on a page. It could be toward the top. It could be toward the bottom. It can vary depending on the design. And you'll see in a couple lectures when I show you all about portfolios, you'll really see a lot of this um, in example form where these flow lines are gonna vary. Grid module is essentially the combination of a column interval and a flow line. And it gives us one little block on a particular page. And they're designed to support the text and visual elements of the page to give an underlying structure for them. And the number of modules can vary from one design to another. This is another great example here of a flow line. And I just have to point it out. That right there is a flow line. You can see how everything's lined up really nicely on that, but it's toward the bottom of the page rather than toward the top of the page. So here's our grid module. Again, combination between the um, column intervals and the flow lines. It would be, it would include these as well, but then it would look like it was just columns. So each one of these squares, so that square, that square, and then this one, you get the idea. All of these are what are those um, grid modules. So as you start to think of it in design, here we are. Now we don't always have every one of these filled with just one image. Sometimes two are added together and we get the text spanning across two of those grid modules. So we can break the grid intelligently at any point in time. So how do we work with this basic grid? We're using it to unify and order the compositional space. So we're giving this underlying structure that's helping organize our thoughts, helping organize our elements, but it's also not you know, on top of us. We're not seeing it that much. And a lot of the examples I've shown, save for this previous one, it's pretty hard to see 
that there's an underlying grid structure. If we went back to this one, for example, there is most definitely an underlying grid structure to this, but it's not as blatantly obvious as it could be. Sorry, I need to skip forward, stop. All right, well, I have to let it play out. It's a little animation here. There we go. So what, what are the tricks of working with a grid? Well, first off, you need to avoid the arbitrary grid. So you don't just throw a grid down and not pay attention to the size and say, oh, that'll be good enough. You wanna think about what is your page format? What's the complexity of what you're trying to show? And how big should one of these elements be? I had a really good personal example that happened when I was working with a grid. Uh, this was on the first ever portfolio that I worked on. And I was working on a computer. So I had you know, the monitor and I zoomed in and I was working and I had all these little squares and I was filling different squares with things and it was all you know, laid out in a composition. And when I went to print it out, all the squares were so small, you couldn't see any of the content. So it ended up being a very arbitrary grid in this context. And it really wasn't sized appropriately for the content I was trying to show. So we want to be aware of that kind of stuff. Single column grids. This is the, the easiest setup for any body of large text. And this is what you inherently do when you're working on an English paper uh, or a history paper. And that is that you have a huge block of text and the space is defined by the margin. It gives you one column. And that's, that's it. It's one big block of text and the margins define the page. Now it is possible that the margins need a bit of adjustment. Obviously the example that I'm showing here has a big colorful background and the text has been kind of shrunk down a little bit. But let's say we were doing a classical layout here. We've got a sample block of text. Obviously this text doesn't actually say anything, but it's a good block of text to kind of see a layout. And what happens here is that the sides and the bottom tend to be rather large in their size. And the top tends to be a little bit smaller. If we have what's called facing pages. So the example here where we have two facing, yeah, there it is nice and big here. The example here where we have two facing pages, that means that this is the left side of the book. This is the right side of the book. This would be the spine of the book. So it's folding toward us. In this example, the inner margin here is a little bit less than the outer margin right there. Sometimes they say it's as much as half. I think this is more than half. It's about three quarters of what it is, right? The bottom margin here is actually very similar to this margin. So we're carrying that around. The page number is in the margin because it's a, a sub element. And so this would be a good layout for facing pages. If you didn't have facing pages, your margins on either side, so this side and this side, would end up being the same. And that's what's set up by default. Don't forget, though, to remember things like the rule of thirds and our compositional strategies, because a lot of times that can really help your layouts as you think about it. So rule of thirds is always a big one as we start to set these things up. Multiple column grids. So these contain several spatial intervals. They give you tons and tons of options from a composition standpoint, and they're really compatible with a complex design. So if we have a lot of content, a lot of different content that we're trying to work with, using a multiple column grid can be a great strategy. Um, you can obviously create movement, drama, rhythm, et cetera, with this. Let's look at this poster, and you'll see that today, a lot of the examples that I'm gonna show are actual lecture series posters. So there's a reason I'm showing you this because I'm trying to get your brain thinking about what's happening and what are we going to do with a lecture series poster, which is your next assignment. But if we look at this example right here, we can start to identify some clear components. I would argue that this is maybe a four column layout. Maybe it's a five column layout. It depends whether you want to consider the margins. But I would say that this is one column. That would be the next column, that would be the next column, and that would be the next column. So I'd say it's four. One, two, three, four columns. I would say this is a margin. And I would say over here, this is a margin. So we have margin and four columns. Then we're going to look for our flow line. 
So in this context, our flow line is coming right across there. That's our primary flow line. And it's accentuated by a few key elements. The end of the, uh, the kind of grayish background that's happening. And I know there's a little jog there, but the top of the text continues that line, that visual line across. So that would be our flow line. That also gives us a really great focal point and intersection point to start our view of this particular project. And that's where the title up here, let me switch colors again, the title right here gets divided into the DAAP and lecture series. This point right there is where we start our, our visual inspection of this particular poster. So we're using that to our advantage. Notice that this kind of follows the rule of thirds. We have about a third up top, right? This is about one third. This is about two thirds in content. So we're still using that photographic compositional technique that we were using before. Modular grids. These are extensions of multiple column grids with the uh, addition of horizontal flow lines. We saw this image before and you end up with grid modules. When you think about what a module is, you wanna think about two things. What is the ideal width or line length of a paragraph? If you have a landscape oriented page, it's awkward if we had a body of text, a paragraph that filled the whole 11 inches because it's a long way to read. We're not used to reading that long. Even an eight and a half by 11 page when we're reading across, let's say uh, the margins are an inch and a quarter, if we're reading across by seven inches or, or whatever, it's still a lot of a fairly long line, line length compared to like a magazine column, which is only a couple inches. So we think about what is the average line length? What, is, what do we wanna see as a line length? And that's gonna help inform what our module size should be. It's also determined by the smallest size of a photograph or illustration. I use that example in my first portfolio where I used too many little small pictures and you couldn't see them when I printed them out because they were just too small. So you wanna think through that strategy. What's the smallest size of a photograph? What's the smallest size of a paragraph that you wanna have? Your module shouldn't be any smaller than that. Of course, in either context, let's say that our line length in our paragraph, you know, we needed a little bit more length, but our image could be a little bit smaller. Well, our paragraph could always span two modules. So you pick whatever the smaller one is and that becomes your absolute smallest in terms of a grid module. Modular grids increase compositional flexibility and they're flexible enough to accommodate changing content over the course of a project. You guys are gonna have a really big challenge coming up and that is your final in this class is a portfolio. You're gonna have a whole bunch of different things in a whole bunch of different sizes that are somehow going to have to fit in a portfolio. That's a complex, difficult task. And if you have a good underlying backbone, a good grid module, you should be able to accommodate all those various size pieces. Alternative grids. So of course, not everything falls on a, on a strict, normal rectilinear grid. They can be loose and organic. They rely heavily on intuitive placement of objects. And that's the truth. You have to kind of look at it and say, does that feel right? We can of course always use the rule of thirds. Guess what? One third, two thirds. Right, so those happen on all of these um, very frequently. To me, this would be a little bit stronger if this was down a little bit more, but you get the idea. So it's an intuitive sense for compositional strategy. Sometimes they evolve from basic grids. Maybe we take a basic grid, but we skew lines in a certain direction. We shift. Those are ways of, of, of establishing this. Usually it's the visual elements that define the page. Compositional structure is often based on a dominant focal point or visual element. So let's look at this poster a little bit larger. So this is fundamentally not based on a grid. We can look at it and say, is there, is there a set of columns here? Well, not really. There's a little bit of a column on the right side, but it's really fundamentally not about that. So to me, this is a, this is a perfect example of something that doesn't have a traditional grid, it has a, a, you know, a modified grid. And that is that we have some strong diagonals happening here and here. We have some strong diagonals happening here and there. And those diagonals are leading us into this particular composition. 
So we, we understand through that, through those diagonals, that this box right here is really important. And that tells us right here that there's an exhibition and fashion show. So our eyes are led into that. As part of our eyes leading into it, we see these giant design, architecture, art, and planning text. So that's part of the journey in, but our focus and attention ends up in this square. And then we understand that it's an exhibition and fashion show. And then we see additional information below. But this is set up on a very different grid than a traditional grid, but it's still guiding the viewer to the primary content. Here's another example of several pages that are on an alternative grid. We can see similarities though. So in this first page, we have a strong diagonal right there. Guess what? That strong diagonal repeats itself right here. This line here repeats itself right here through that text. So there is a series of elements that repeat page after page. And that's really important as part of this alternative grid. So even though we have an alternative grid that's highly based on intuition, there's a repetition to it as we start to see it across, let's say a portfolio or a book. That's a really important distinction. Breaking the grid. Grids are great to provide a base, whether it's the alternate grid that we were just talking about or whether it's a traditional grid, they're really great as a base. But you also have to think as a designer about where you break the grid because often that point where you break the grid is the, the nexus. It's the point where you're really excited about something and you're drawing attention to it. If you imagine walking into a building that was a series, it was a grid and it had all these columns in it and there was one place there where there wasn't a column, you would naturally be gravitating toward that place because it's a little bit more spacious because it's missing a column. So those are keys that we can give ourselves in the design process where we deliberately remove, we deliberately break. Um, that's, a, that's a really important thing. If you break, however, the grid too often, then the grid's either not appropriate or you're overusing it and you're not getting the advantage. It's the wrong grid. So you wanna go back and think about it. So one break here, one break here, that's excellent. If we're constantly having to change it or modify it, then something's not right. So let's talk about the interaction of visual elements. And this is a really important piece, is that we wanna think about a hierarchy that we're developing in terms of visual elements. What are we seeing as our clear focal point? Where are we starting? What's next as we read it? What's next after that? And we're leading the person who's viewing this particular piece through some kind of a meaningful journey. We're telling them what to read first, what to read second, what to read third. If a hierarchy isn't established, you get distracted and overloaded and you're not concentrating and you move on. So how do we establish that hierarchy? Well, if it comes to a lecture series poster, we wanna think about what's number one item? What's the most important thing that we're gonna talk about? Well, in this example, I would argue that it's National Portfolio Day. So item number one, I'm gonna go back and uh, right in red, I think it shows up a little bit better. So item number one would be right here, National Portfolio Day. That would be item number one. What's the second level in the hierarchy? Well, it's kind of a combination of the fact that California College, oh, shoot, sorry, put my hand down on it. California College of the Arts is hosting it and when it's being hosted. So I would argue that those are kind of on the same level. Maybe the date is slightly more important, but in terms of hierarchy, we'll label those both as two. What's the third element? It's probably this element right here. And that's telling us, I can't, sorry, I keep hitting the edge of my iPad. Um, the third element right here is probably telling us where. I know it's a little small and blurry. And then we've got a fourth element down here. And then finally, we've got our fifth element down here. They don't have to go in order down the page. But in terms of looking at it, we have a clear established hierarchy. And if you were to step back and look at this poster and kind of squint at it, I always talk about squinting at it because that kind of gives you the general sense of color and what's popping out versus when your eyes are open, you don't see it as well. The National Portfolio Day does really stand out. And so that should be the primary element. And then we can see how it evolves from there. So let's look at some other examples. I like to think of this as a 12, 6, 3, 1. You could pick any numbers. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm having the distance. So if I were to look at this particular po portfolio poster, uh, excuse me, this particular uh, lecture poster or portfolio day poster, and I were to stand at, back at 12 feet away from it, 
imagine it on a wall, what would leap out at me? Well, obviously the art would leap out, but what else? Well, probably the fact that it's National Portfolio Day. So right up here, this would be item number one. And that's gonna stand out at 12 feet. If I move to six feet, am I gonna see something new and something more interesting? Well, maybe at six feet, I'm starting to read this detail. So this is subordinate element two. We've got the date and the, the location of it. Now, if I move to three feet and at six feet, I'm not gonna see any of this text over on the left side. But if I move to three feet, maybe I can read this text. And then if I move all the way up to one foot away, can I see something that I wouldn't otherwise see? So if you start defining or thinking about your design in terms of these distances, you wanna provide something interesting for people to look at at every one of those distances. And that's what invites people into your work. It makes them excited about seeing your work. And you can use the same principle in a presentation. Let's say you're doing a studio presentation, whether it's an architectural project or it's an industrial design project, you're standing up in front of a crowd and you're presenting your ideas, the people in the back of the room should be able to get something off of your boards or off of your presentation. And the people in the front row should be able to get something different. And if I were to stand up and get closer to your work, let's say I was reviewing your work, when I got closer, I should see something even more different. So at every one of those levels, at every one of those distances, you should be presenting some kind of an idea. So as you think about this lecture series poster that we're going to be doing, think about those distances and how as you get closer, there should always be something new and innovative that you're seeing. That's inviting the person in to view this particular drawing. So as I've been doing, we're ranking the visual elements by importance. What's the first? What's the second? what's the third, and we're making sure that those emphasis that happens in a correct order. It could be something as simple as just the size of the font. It also might have to do with the art. In this example here, this particular poster, we're seeing much more emphasis on the, the art of National Portfolio Day, but it sure stands out. If you were to stand back across the room and look at this poster, you'd be intrigued by the National Portfolio Day. And we'd get an increase in these visual elements as we got closer. The other thing that can be very important and a lot of times is overlooked is the idea of space. And where does the space fall in a particular composition? Space always provides a visual contrast and it gives us a clue as to where to start reading or what to start looking at. So it really helps organize. An empty space has a tendency to bring elements alive. Don't forget to focus on the negative space as well as the positive space. So in this particular example, and I don't think I have it as large. Let me back up here. In this particular example, the space that's happening right here, the empty space, is actually what your eye is drawn toward. And because of that space, it tells you where you should start reading. So we get drawn to this space and we start reading National Portfolio Day. So this space becomes absolutely critical for us understanding what it is we're supposed to be reading. Here's another good example. The space directs our eye as to what we're supposed to be reading. So as we look at this cover here, the space that's right here, the empty space, is actually what grabs our attention. It's the negative space. And from that space, we understand that we're supposed to read the title, Masterpieces. So it's really interesting that space or negative space can actually be a visual element. Sometimes you want to group elements together to provide a focal point. Sometimes you need that empty space to provide the focal point. Generally speaking, centering an object and equalizing the space around it inactivates it. It makes it not exciting and less effective. If we create some kind of an off-center composition, here's, here comes the rule of thirds again. We have a weighted asymmetrical composition. It becomes interesting. The other thing is we can't have too much space, too small of an element against too large of a backdrop. That's not going to work either. Right, so if I had this piece of paper and I drew an element and I put it right here, that wouldn't be very exciting. Even if I enlarged it and I put it right here in the dead center, that's not very exciting either. However, 
if I took that same object and I put it down here, we now have something that's off-centered and weighted, and it gives us all this space around to work with. So as we start to lay these pieces out, we want to think about how do we activate a space? How do we put our content in a place where we're excited about it and activated? And then maybe something else goes here. And maybe something else goes down here. And suddenly we're starting to activate the space. We're using the space around as part of our composition. Scale. Certainly scale can be used to establish hierarchy. So if we have different scale of text, we have a great way of establishing hierarchy. Larger text, more emphasis. Smaller text, less em emphasis. And we work our way through. So we have another poster here. Largest text. Sorry, I'm yawning. Oh. Uh, largest text right there. Next level text, most bold right there. Third level right there. Fourth level as you get thinner text. There's kind of a natural dividing line right here. And so I would argue that everything down here is kind of a, a fifth element. And then all the way down at the bottom, all those photographs, those would be, I can't draw, there we go, the sixth element. So that scale, just the scale of text can establish that hierarchy. Quantity, too many elements, you get a clutter or a lack of order. Make sure that all of the elements that you're using have a specific function. And there's really two ways of going about doing this. You can do an additive or a subtractive method. And it depends on how your brain works as to which way uh, is more effective. So the additive method is you start with a blank canvas and you add one element to it. And you say, is that enough? Do I need another element? I add a second element. Is that enough? It's getting close. Let me put a third element on. Oh yeah, that looks really good. Let me put a fourth element on. Oh, that's too many. Let me go back to the third. That's the additive method. We start with a blank canvas. Some people, for some people, that's how their brain works and that's how they want to do it. The alternative is you put everything you could possibly want on the page and you subtract. You say, okay, here's everything I think fits on the page. Eh, it's a little too crowded. Let me take one thing out. Does it look better? Yeah, not quite. Let me take another thing out. Does it look better? Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Let me take one more thing out just in case. Nope, that was too many things. Let me put it back. So you can use an additive method or a subtractive method to get rid of or add to your composition. And it's a good way of understanding quantity and what's too much and what's too little. Orientation and position can often lead to a very strong contrast that, is, that enhances the hierarchy. It's not gonna be the hierarchy by itself, but what we're doing is everything's organized horizontally on the page and then something breaks it, something's vertical suddenly. And that stands out and causes us to focus. Don't forget about diagonals either. Do I have this one big? Perfect. This is a good example here. So there's a natural break in this page. And that natural break happens right here when we contrast the girl with the background. And so we see that in contrast to the horizontal text. And that's where we get our focal point, right there. Now, this one's a little bit awkward because it's written backwards, but the biggest, boldest text is dreamer. And then on top, we can go the other direction. I am a true dreamer, a visionary, a believer, a creator. But it's that point that we start our focus on this particular page. So they're using a contrast in elements to provide that focus. You can also do this through perspective. In this case, things that are closest to you become more um, dominant, more important, and things that are further away from you in the composition are less important. So we can set it up that way. So it's about the composition. It moves the composition away from just the flat layout. We're using that third dimension and we're, we're creating depth. I think it's harder to do in graphic design than it is in some of the other fields, but this is definitely a strategy um, to, to use that three dimensions. We spent a whole lecture last class talking about um, typography and the importance of font choice and the little details, the, the tracking, the kerning, all of those things. Typography is just as important as all the other elements that you're putting on the page. So you want to think both in macro and micro scales. 
Is the small detail right? Is the big detail right? Because text is a critical element to any of these compositions. Color is also a great way to provide visual interest. You could emphasize a specific element. You can, of course, use a comprehensive color palette where you have a bunch of different colors, or you could just use a single highlight color. You want to consider the tone of your design with what color you're choosing as well. Now, we'll spend a whole class talking about color theory and, and what, what colors are good for what purposes, et cetera. But for right now, pick a color that you like. So a great example, when I did my uh, final thesis in grad school, um, I picked one color. So all of my drawings were in black and white, except for one color. And I used that one color. It was red at the time. And I used that one color to identify and, and focus on key elements. So when somebody was looking at my presentation, even if I wasn't there to explain it, they would understand on this drawing, this is important because it's in red. On this drawing, this is important because it's highlighted in red. So you can use that to your advantage in terms of focusing attention. You can also introduce graphic lines, shapes, linear elements. Those are used to provide the, 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 the support for content and they can direct viewers with what's, what should we look at? So here's a good example. We have this plus sign showing up right there. That's focusing our, our, uh, our interest right there and we understand their little slogan here. So it can be a good way of directing it. One of the problems though, is that people put too many of these things on a particular page. It's particularly noticeable in the first drafts of the portfolio. As you start to work on portfolios, uh, and you come to your uh, um, check-ins and we look at your portfolios, one of the first things people do is they put too many horizontal vertical lines and they divide up the page in a bunch of ways. Well, that ends up being detract, it detracts from the overall composition because there's too much of it. A line here, a line there, that can be great. So think about what is appropriate, how many are appropriate. Bill, you're saying, isn't there a convention of how many colors the eye can pick up? Yes, there's all kinds of things about um, what, what we do in terms of color and, and how we draw interest in color. I'm gonna save that until we get to the color theory lecture, but there will be a color theory lecture coming. I think it's, uh, one, what is it, 115, I think. So we're coming, we're at 111. So in four days uh, or four class days, we'll get to it, all right? Don't quote me on that. It might be in five or six. Um, so in review, you as the designer, you need to establish that hierarchy. That's a really critical component for your overall design. You order and control the design from there. You use contrast to provide a focus point, focal area, make somebody interested in something specific, and then you use those other compositional factors to support your design. So I'll show you a bunch more examples here as we're going through. These are moving more from the poster into the portfolio uh, kind of layout. We will talk specifically about portfolios coming up and I'll, I'll give you a bunch of examples of portfolios and you'll see examples of portfolios. But on all of these pages, this is a consistent book, you'll see consistency from page to page. So for example, on this page, pay attention to where that flow line is at the very top here. Notice that that shows up right there, just a, a little bit of it. So even though the image bleeds off the page, we're still getting that flow line. And so as you look at this body of work, you can see a consistency to it. So if we look here, we've got a line that's running across this page here. That same line lines up right there. So there's a consistency page to page. The underlying structure is there, and that's part of how the page is organized. And you can see how those flow together into a whole body of work. I think that's the last one that I'll show you for today. Like I said, we'll revisit portfolios in more depth. I'm going to jump out of that. And I'm going to see if the um, remote desktop is going to decide to work for me. We'll give it one more shot. And if not, I'll do, I'll do it on my own computer. I'm saying it's probably not. So uh, let me go ahead and bring up InDesign.
Come on. It's loading. All right. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start with a slightly different size page. So I said four by six. So I'm gonna go into the more presets. And of course it shows up on the my other screen here. So hold on I move things around. There we go. And so over here on the right side, I'm gonna change these manually. So under units, I'm gonna to go to inches and I'm gonna change my width to be four and my height to be six. So I set that up as four by six. Uh, I'm gonna uncheck this facing pages. So it's not a book, it's just a single page. And then over here, we have columns. I could set up columns on the page. I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna do it manually. But I also have margins. And I'm gonna take my margins away for right now and I'll do it manually. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in zero. Because this little chain link is set, when I change the top margin to zero, all the rest of them will change consistently. So I'll go ahead and click on create. And it should give me a four by six document to work with. And there we go. So I have my four by six document. So we've been working in InDesign previously. So the, the layout space is similar. But what I want to talk about today is thinking a little bit more about your design process. How are you gonna divide up this page? So for example, if I look at my rulers, right? I have zero to six inches at the bottom of my page. So I could think about where is a one third line, for example. So a one third line would be at two inches. Maybe I'll make it a little bit more. Maybe I'll go at an inch and a half. So it's not quite one third, it's more like a quarter. If I want to jump to one of these ruler intervals, I can actually hold down the shift key on my keyboard and it'll jump to each ruler interval for me. So there it is at an inch and a half and I can let it go as kind of a guide. And this might be a good place to start thinking about my design. I could also use these guides, right? I could come over and I could set kind of a side. So maybe I want the side at three eighths of an inch right there. And maybe that's kind of my side layout. And then I could set up some columns if I wanted to. So we could come over here to a column. I could come over here, give a, a, a little break between the columns. And I could come over here to create the next column. Maybe like that. And I could have another break. And then I have a, a, a bit of a margin over here. And right now it's a little bit off center. Maybe I need to move these after the fact. So remember, it's easy to move them. So I can move this over. Again, I'm holding down shift. I can move this, oops. Sorry, I have to move just this one. It's a little bit better. No, sorry. There it is, like that. So maybe I'm setting it up like that, okay? So we're just, we have different strategies for how we're, we're, we're kind of establishing it. And I'm using these rulers to kind of be a guide. I don't have to though. So if I found that I didn't like these rulers, I could click on any one of them and then press the delete key on the keyboard and it will go away. So let me come back and I'll add that one back again for right now. And so now if I start to think about adding right, a frame, I could come in here with the frame tool and I could click and draw to create a particular frame. Remember, I can hold down the shift again if I want to keep it in proportion so it's perfectly square as an option. The other thing that I can do if I know what size I want, right, I can go ahead and just type in that value. So I can say, you know what, I want a, sorry, I want a frame if I single click I could want a frame that is a particular width and height. So maybe I want a frame that is uh, one and a half by one and a half, for example. I could go ahead and say, okay, and there's a frame at one and a half by one and a half. Right? And I could align that like that. I could copy this or I could create another one. So let's do another one at an inch and a half by an inch and a half. And there's my next one. 
Now, the nice thing about InDesign is as I start to move these elements, if I have the guides, you can see that it's aligning to the guides as I start to create them. If I don't have the guides, however, I can still lay out my work. So I've got those two. I'd like to have a couple more. So I'm just going to copy it, Control C. On a, man, it's, uh, on a Mac, it's Command C. Uh, and there's a second one. There's a third one. And here's a fourth one down there. And there's another one. Okay, so what about, I've created them, but the, the spacing's not distributed evenly. It's not really working correctly. So let's look at something called the align tools. So I'm gonna go up to the window and I'm gonna choose align. It's under objects and layout and align. And it'll bring up this extra little supposed to bring up this extra little dialog box. Oh, it's on my other monitor, I'm sorry. There it is. And these are the fundamental of the align tools. In the interest of not being confusing, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of these um, background guides just so that you can see this a little bit better. And I'll move these up on the page just so you can see them. So the align tools allow us to align objects. So for example, if I had these three objects and they weren't aligned right now, I could take and select all three of those and I can make them all aligned to the center by clicking the center. Now in this case, it averaged and it put them all in the same place. But let's say that I really like the position of this object. So when I select the objects, I have the opportunity to, without holding any keys down, I can make an additional click on one of the objects and it gets highlighted. There it is highlighted. That then becomes what's called the key object. So that key object right there can then be used to do the rest of the alignment. So I'm picking that as the key object and I'm then aligning the horizontal to that object. So it's different. So if I pick the key object instead down here and I align to the centers, it's going to keep this object in place and align those objects to it. So I can work backwards and forwards depending on what my spacing or what my, my object desires would be. So in this case, let's pick this as the key object. Let's align to the center. Notice that there is also align to the right and align to the left. So if my objects weren't the same, I could align to the left or to the right. I can also align to the top. So right now, if I clicked on align to the top, all the lines, all the objects would be on top of each other. So if I went back one more, now I've clicked align to the top, there they all are aligned to the top. So then we move down into the next set, which is distribute objects. So with distribute objects, we may need a little bit more. I'm going to, We'll come back to the, this size. I need a few more objects. So hold on a second. Oops. There we go. Let me copy and paste a few more times. OK. So I'm not saying that this is the right layout. I'm just using this as an example. So I could pick all of these objects and I could pick the topmost object and I could say, let's align to the centers. Then this distribute objects is going to allow me to distribute the objects so that they're evenly spaced in between each other. So if I click on this, I'm sorry. No, it's not doing what I wanted to. Oh, sorry, distribute spacing. So down here, Right, I can use, wait, hold on, new spacing. Let's go two inches. There we go, now it's gonna work. There we go. And I could say, I want these objects that are appearing every two inches, or I could say, I want them every one inch. And then I can distribute the object. Or since I want a little more space, 1.25. Sorry, I hadn't put the spacing in yet. So for me, Right, This is a little bit more difficult to use than the distribute spacing down here at the bottom. So the distribute spacing is where you can actually determine what do you want for space in between these objects. 
So if I knew, for example, I wanted an eighth of an inch, 0.125, I could then say, give me an eighth of an inch between every one of these objects. Well, maybe that was too much. Maybe I want a 16th of an inch. So that would put 0.0625. Oops. 0.0625, distribute the objects. Now there's a 16th between each object. So that can be really useful, these distribute spacing. Furthermore, I could take all of these objects, right? And I could use them with this object as well. And I could say, I want my horizontal spacing to be a 16th of an inch. So it's gonna move those over. Oh, it moved all of my objects over. So let's go back. We'll deselect this object, pick this as the key object and move them all over to be centered. So they're just different strategies for organizing your work. And so that's what I want you to experiment with today. But let's look further than just these alignment tools. So I'm gonna come back to where I have the three, these three. Let's pick this as my key object. Let's distribute the spacing. So we've got that. Let's take these three, let's copy them. I'm, again, control C, control V. We'll move them next door, like that. We want the spacing to match. So let's take these two. We'll keep this as a key object. We'll distribute the spacing. Good. Let's take all three of these. I believe they're already set. Let's make sure they're aligned. And there we go. So I have these set up as my grid modules. Now, what if I want to place into these? So we can go up to File and then Place. And I can go into, I need some photographs here. Uh, let's see. Since I'm on my own computer, I don't have everything ready. So hold on a second. Oops. All right. So here's some example images, right? There's one. And I'll drop it in. And if I right click on the object, hold on, I'm still thinking. It's probably waiting to download the full image. That's my fault. While it's doing that, let me go ahead and download that folder so I have all the files. Sorry. Yep, it was waiting to download. Bear with me for just a second. All right, it's syncing those. So back to InDesign. I could right click and I could go to fitting and I could fill frame proportionally. And there's my image in this particular frame. I could take this image and I can do the same thing, file and then place. And we can drop this image in, there it is. I'll right click and I'll go to fitting, fill frame proportionally. But this image kind of was a longer image. So maybe I want this image to span across two frames. So I have two options here. The first option, I could delete one of the frames and then break and, and change this such that this image then spans both frames or, or, or both grid modules. I could go to file and then place and I could drop that same file in. There it is, right click fitting, fill frame proportionally. Now that looks a lot better because I'm getting the whole bridge versus just that small piece. The other strategy though, might be that you want to keep these two divided, but have the image span across both. Well, I can do that too. So I could select both of these. Again, I've selected both of those. I can go up to my object menu and I can go to um, paths and then choose make compound path. So it's objects, paths, make compound path. And when I do that, notice that the X changes from being one in each, just spanning across both of these. I can then place my object. I can go to File and then Place. 
I'm going to pick a different image this time. I can right click and go to fitting, fill frame proportionally, and it's filling, but I still have that gap in between. So I'm filling both of these frames. They don't have to be contiguous. So I could take these two, let me copy them, let me drop them up here. like that. And I could take one, two, and three. Sorry, one, two, three. And I could go up to my object compound path, or excuse me, object paths, make compound path. Those are all together. And then I could go to file and then place. And we could drop yet another image in. Let me right click and go to fitting. We'll fill frame proportionally. There you go. Now you can see it spanning those frames. So there's a strategy for how you start to work with your frames. So obviously you can customize them like this where you adjust the frame, but you can also have images that span across frames. And this may or mean, may not be something you want to do. Obviously like this person's cut in half because of that. But it might be a look that you want. Let me go ahead and get rid of a few of these. I'm going to copy this and I'll paste it there. And then let me replace the image. So I'll go to file and then place. It is command D or control D, by the way. And then right click and go to fitting, fill frame proportionally. And there's that piece there. Okay, so this is how I'm kind of starting to establish things. What about if I wanted some kind of an object that wasn't a rectangle? So notice under the frame tool, then I can choose other types of objects. So I could choose an ellipse, for example, and I could place an image into that ellipse. There it is. I could right click and go to fitting, fill frame proportionally, and there it is in an ellipse. But basically any object that I create is something that I can paste into. So even if it's not a rectangle, an ellipse, or a polygon, I could actually use and draw a custom shape. And we're gonna work through the pen tool a little bit later on. So don't, don't panic if this doesn't make sense, but I wanna introduce this as a concept, right? So I have this shape that I drew. I can use that to place an image. So I can go to file and then place, and I could place an image into that shape. Again, right click fitting, fill frame proportionally, and there it is in that shape. One of the cool things about custom shapes is that you can use this white arrow, which is called the direct select tool to modify the shape and you'll get more image or less image. You can do the same thing with any one of these pre-existing shapes. So we could select it, we could go to the white tool and we could move one of the corners. Come on. There it is. And I can adjust that, or I can make it smaller. So if you were doing a layout that wasn't a traditional grid, you might be trying to create or draw shapes that were not traditional. Let me create a new page here, and we'll get to multiple pages a little bit later on. But if I was doing something that wasn't traditional, right, I could set up an object that I drew like that. And then I could paste or place, excuse me, one of my images into that kind of an object. Let's use that one. Right click fitting, fill frame proportionally, and there it is. Now, one of the things to keep in mind here though, is that this currently has a black line that goes all the way around it because I have a black stroke color. So if I wanted that to be not outlined in black, I'd have to change the black stroke to be transparent. So it's like this. So I could set up my own, let me use that direct select. I'm gonna make a few modifications just so this becomes slightly more attractive. So hold on with me for a second. All right, let me go to right click and then fitting, fill frame proportionally just so we can see it there. And then I could create another shape
like that no stroke color and then i could place this so i'll go to file and then place and i could drop this image in there right click fitting fill frame proportionally and there it is so the point is i could create any shapes that i want and fill those objects as i want that being said i could also use other shapes so let's use the text tool for example and let's write something in text so i'm going to use dvc and I'm going to change the font of DVC. So let's come over here. I don't have the DVC font on my computer, but I'm going to pick something that's just kind of a nice thick font. Let's up the size here. We need to go bigger than that. Let's go up to 100. I need to make my box a little bit bigger. And there it is. So I can take this type. And I can actually create objects out of the type. So I can go up to object, or excuse me, the type menu, and I can choose to create outlines, which is right here. So it's under type and then create outlines. And then I can use this object to place an image. So I can go to file and then place. And now that becomes my frame. So I can go to fitting and fill frame proportionally. So the point is that any object that you can create in InDesign, you can fill or you can place an, uh, a photograph into. So it's kind of a unique and powerful tool as you start to set that up, okay? So those are all options. So what I want you to play around with today is the align tools and making sure you understand how they work and then understand how you can place objects into uh, multiple frames maybe how you might modify frames, et cetera. Okay, so uh, in terms of content for today, I don't really care what kind of content you're using. Um, you know, ideally I suggest using the architecture or the, um, you know, like a program postcard or something like that. That's fine because it gives you something to work with and some text to copy from. If you want to do a, something, a, a postcard for something else you're interested in, that's okay. This is about experimentation here and kind of getting comfortable with InDesign in kind of a more complex way. Okay. So we do have our check-ins like we've had previously. So let me stop my share here. There we go. We have our check-ins like we've had uh, in previous weeks. A lot of you came um, on Monday. That's great. You don't have to come back today unless you want to. Uh, those of you that didn't come on Monday, I hope that you'll come on uh, sometime today. We'll take about a 10-minute break. We'll start back up at about 9.15 for those of you that want to uh, stick around and do that. Otherwise, I'll see you at one of the other check-ins today. Does anybody have any questions before I let you go? I, I have a uh... Question: sure. Can you show me where is the bold uh, for text for texting in uh, in uh, IDesign? In InDesign, sure. Uh, let me come back and share my screen again. Because I found only if it's uh, in the, uh, inside the text, but I can't find if I want to. Okay, so if I was writing here, all right, there's my DVC. Okay. Under properties, depending on the font. You, yeah, may have, you may have, I don't have it. right. So in, in this particular font, Minion Pro, I don't have a bold option that has been created by the font creator. So I can't just, it's not like Word where you can just have the operating system do it. There is an alternative though. So let me make this bigger so you can hopefully see it. Okay. So let's jump this up. So there it is. I don't have an option for bold. However, I do have both a fill color and a stroke color. So right now I have my fill color as black, but my stroke color is transparent. If I add a stroke color, so right here, if I add this stroke color, it's going to make the text thicker. See how it became thicker? Yeah. Let me, let me back up and I'll do two of these side by side. So you can see there's the original. No, I, I did it uh, when I tried to bog it. I thought, I thought that uh, there is additional uh, way to do it, but uh, okay. Yes, so you can up the stroke color. Now, with the stroke color, if you want to continue to make it thicker, you can increase the, the stroke weight ah, okay. to make it even thicker. Great. Okay, so the other option, though, is depending on the font. So if we went up to one of these other fonts, let's see if I can pick one that I know. Uh, this is one that... Um, that's on Max, this Helvetica new, uh, there are a whole variety of weights that are listed. 
And the difference here is that this is, and, and the way InDesign works is the font, if the font family has these font versions, they'll be displayed. Otherwise, there's no operating system override where you can just thicken up the, the font. You have to thicken it up with the stroke weight. Does that make sense? Yes. So depending on what your font choice is, you may have options or you may not have options. But I need to enter each of the uh, options to see if there is it, if there is option. You would have to pick the font to see. And, and then yes. when we start to get into Mac or Windows and in a Mac, you can actually see it easier than you can in Windows um, if you weren't looking, but that's, that's kind of beside the point. Okay, thank you. So, so that's, that's how it would be set up in InDesign. Okay. Perfect. Any other questions? All right. Sounds good. Uh, I'll see you back in a few minutes if you're sticking around for check-ins. Otherwise, have a great weekend and I'll see you on Monday.